Right. Dr. Joe Zendel, I want to talk early detection of cancer here sure. for a little bit. You're a cancer biologist. I mean, you know things that are going on in a cancer cell, but I want to kind of wide angle this for a minute. Yeah. And there's a lot of newer things out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, Pernuvo scans, there's different CT scans you can do. I mean, but where does someone start when it comes down to early detection? I mean, we both lost our parents to cancer, and right. I do argue that early detection, in both of our cases, it sounds like probably would have helped them a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in every single case, early detection increases survivability of any any cancer or any disease for that matter. But regarding early detection, uh, we've gotten a lot better, and I've, I've mentioned the, the technological advancements we've had over time. Um, We've gotten a lot better at diagnosing things in earlier stages. There's now some blood biopsy tests, which I think are really promising. Um, I don't know if they're entirely covered by insurance yet, but they need they need to be prescribed by somebody, uh, some sort of a physician. Um, so those blood-based tests, but I will also say, you know, companies like Pranuvo are at the forefront of, of you know, their, their, MRI, their MRI technology in terms of, you know, not using contrast agents to get high-resolution imaging. Uh, of full body scans <clears throat> to be able to to detect cancers in their earlier stages. You know, obviously it's 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 important to couple those tests with multiple types of tests to be able to determine if somebody has a specific type of cancer, but uh, they can be very informative, at least in early stages, to to detecting potential lesions which could be cancerous. So, you know, Prenuvo is one of those uh, companies that has really good uh, imaging techniques regarding MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and Grail is another company that has blood-based biopsies, which can screen for some cancers better than others. Um, you know, early early cancer detection by potentially detecting uh, mutations of DNA, or, or even like uh, methylation status. Uh, some companies have things that detect um, global methylation patterns, um, which can be indicative of uh, of genes that are suppressed in early stages of cancer, uh, typically uh, tumor suppressor genes. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of interesting tests coming out, uh, coming out regarding blood biopsies and, and imaging techniques for diagnostic purposes. After today's video, I put a 50% off discount link for Haya Kids Multivitamins. I'm a dad, I've got two young kids, and I can attest to how difficult it is to get them to eat everything that's on their plate. I'm not suggesting that they're lacking in nutrition, but I do think that adding a good multivitamin can be fun and only really beneficial. So Haya is a multivitamin that is chewable, sweetened with monk fruit. So the kids get to have fun. Like our routine is, hey, get your jammies on and then you can have your vitamin. They love it. Like they think they're getting a treat and it's something that's nourishing for them. Plus it's establishing a good pattern. So I think as a dad, it's awesome. And Haya was created by two dads that saw a need in the marketplace and they saw a need that kids really, really needed. So anyhow, that link down below saves you 50% off your first order with Haya. You can check them out. They've got an awesome, awesome lineup, and I think you'll really dig it, and your kids will dig it too. And if they don't like them, they taste good, and you can eat them. If you look at the imaging side of things, Mm -hmm. um, can a lot be seen on the imaging side? Like, I mean, we know in the United States, it's 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 difficult. You can't just walk into your doctor and say, "I want an image." That's what sucks, you know. I wish you could. It's uh, in this can be your opinion because I'm I'm not here to throw anything or anyone under the bus, but Mm -hmm. like. If you could get an image, is that usually enough to say, hey, like, you're fairly clear, you probably don't need to worry? Um, like, or are some of these things like, do they go undetected even through imaging? They can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, every, every, every test has its pitfalls in terms of the things it can and cannot do. That's why I stress the importance of combining those tests just to kind of weed things out. Mm-hmm. Of course, a lot of this also depends on the socioeconomic status of the individual. Right now, because insurance doesn't cover them, unfortunately, um, they're pretty expensive out of pocket, but I think they're a worthy investment if you have the the resources to do it. Um, Because I think, you know, and we've discussed this briefly, that um, the cost in the short term will be much cheaper than than long-term costs. So it'll be cheaper in in the long term, um, basically. And I always encourage people, I mean, like we talked about offline, ask for the cash pay price too, because yeah. a lot of times when you know, you're dealing with insurance, it's like your percentages of a cost. Yes. Yeah. Your percentages of a, of a monumentally larger cost than if you just ask for the cash pay option. It's like, I think I got a couple of CT scans and some contrast MRIs 
you know, done for a couple thousand bucks, which mm-hmm. it sounds like a lot of money, but it probably would have been like five or 6,000 through insurance in, in a lot of cases. And it's the peace of mind that it gave me, mm-hmm. uh, you know, was worth that. And it's probably something I don't need to redo for maybe a, a few years. Right. Yeah. I would say but, maybe every like five years, something yeah. like that. Um, the methylation piece is kind of interesting. So like, can you describe like what methylation is? I know I've kind of described it and it's obviously the ability to sort of turn on and turn off certain genes, but uh, what is methylation? How would a methylation test potentially help? So I guess to, to better understand this premise, we have to talk a little bit about epigenetics. <laughs> so my thesis work was actually based on an epigenetic protein that I studied um, called ARID1A, which is frequently mutated in ovarian clear cell, about 50% of the time actually. Uh, a type of ovarian cancer. Um, and so basically that's an epigenetic regulator. Um, it's part of a massive complex. That's basically the DNA binding component of a massive complex, which regulates the three-dimensional shape of DNA. So you, you need to open and close DNA because it's tightly wound around these big proteins basically called histones. Mm-hmm. You need to unwind them like a ball of yarn from those histones to be able to get the machinery inside cells to access those genes to enable their expression. And there are molecular markers like methylation or acetylation, which can control the unwinding and winding of histones. In this context, methylation promotes suppression of gene expression by enabling the, the DNA interaction. So they, they wind around the histones by because of the methylation, suppresses the machinery that enables transcription or, or expression of those genes. Acetylation is the inverse. It generally promotes expression of the genes because it unwinds the the DNA from those histones, enables expression. So that's why I said if we can understand the methylation status associated with how a cancer cell turns off genes that are commonly turned off in cancers, we can get an idea of um, patterns which might be which might be associated with tumor progression. So whereas Grail might use a test to look at, you know, and I could be mis- misciting this based on their their platform because you know there's some there's, I can't get all the information associated associated with what they do. But um, you know, whereas their test might detect for mutated DNA that's detected in blood, other tests might be able to be in combination with something like that to determine methylation status or even acetylation status. Because some genes are also upregulated in cancers, so you can combine all this information together to get a pretty good picture about you know someone's risks for a, a specific disease like cancer, or, or even other diseases like Alzheimer's too. Yeah, because you know every. Every disease has its own etiology in terms of genes that are expressed and not expressed. Uh, cancer is no exception. It's interesting because I'm familiar with like histone deacetylase inhibition, like the HDAC function of like say a ketone body, like yeah. hydroxybutyrate. Um, and that got me interested in sort of epigenetics in the first place, mm-hmm. you know, at a very superficial level, just enough to probably say things incorrectly sometimes, but it's complicated. It's, so I don't fault you for it. It's, I say it, things incorrectly regarding it too. But what it what it I really have today, <laughs> what it made clear to me was how much like lifestyle or just our uh, our experiences through life and things that we encounter can unwind or wind things up, right? Like it's it's so interesting. That's what I mean, that's fr- the entire premise of yeah. epigenetics. That is like everything about our environment is controlling our epigenome. Yeah. So the things we eat, the things we consume in general, the things we do change your epigenome at any given moment in time in very, very small time scales. Your DNA, your DNA in your nuclei of any given cell at any moment is always unwinding and unwinding to favor tumor or sorry, suppression of genes and expression of genes that are going to be in line with, you know, what that cell needs at that given moment in time to survive. So this is an extremely dynamic process that is always going on in the background, just as every metabolic processes process is. Um, that again, we, we, we can't say that something is so conclusive regarding epigenetics. Yeah. We can, we can just examine like the overall broad phenotype. It's very hard to, to determine those mechanisms, especially, uh, in a disease state. So when someone says like they they have quote unquote poor methylation or it like, doesn't mean to me. Yeah. I was gonna say this is, it's like, cause I mean, what's the, what's the scale, what is right? Poor methylation. Exactly. That's, that's, you need to know the target of, of what is being methylated. You yeah. need to know maybe the enzymes associated with methylating or demethylating that particular target. Yeah. And those things are also incredibly dynamic. Uh, and that's that's one of the challenges in, in cancer is determining, you know, what demethylases are, are upregulated to change 
you know, if you have a, a demethylation, you would assume that it's going to demethylate a gene, which might increase its acetylation or yeah. activation of that gene. Does that expression of that particular gene, is it associated with some phenotype that you're observing? Yeah. That's the mechanistic stuff we try and determine, which, you know, if you're not examining that in the right conditions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, oftentimes we, we talk about the difference between in vivo models and in vitro models. When you do, when you study things in vitro, it's a, it's a very pure system, but it's not physiological most of the time, because in my cell culture media, if I'm looking at like hep G2 cells, as an example, it's a liver cancer cell line. If I'm, you know, putting the cell culture media, media that it needs to grow, it has high amounts of glucose, um, that is not physiologically in line with, uh, what would be capable if that was actually a cell line in the liver. So the met metabolic consequences of that are, are hyper variable and, and as will the epigenetic consequences of that as well. So that's why it's super important for any study to have that in vivo component alongside the in vitro. They both have to support each other because if you don't, and we, we, we found this out over time too, you can have the exact opposite finding in vitro that you would experience in vivo if you don't make sure that there's a correlation there. And we've seen that in even lung cancer studies. There was actually a study, I can't remember when it was published or, or the exact specifics about it, but it, they essentially, they, they it, was, it was a paradigm shift sort of situation where they showed that what we thought about this particular model of lung cancer was wrong because the assumptions were made from in vitro analyses. And those assumptions were pushed on in vivo work, but the support there was weak and they found that it was actually opposite of what they expected mm. when they delved deeply uh, and mechanistically into the in vivo component. Interesting. So we all, always need to translate those two. Without a doubt, yeah. And <laughs> it's challenging to <laughs> say the least. Uh, jumping back to, to scans for a minute, sure. if, if you were to, if there's a small tumor, mm -hmm. there's a small tumor, obviously, n relatively speaking, it's going to vary depending on, I guess, where it is. But can you have like a later stage small tumor? So if, like do, do people automatically think, well, <clears throat> oh, I must not be that far into, you know, because the tumor's not that big. But mm -hmm. if, like, can you have a, a fraction of a centimeter stage four tumor or does stage also reflect size to a certain degree or be like, well, I can't feel a mass in my abdomen, so I must, you know. So this, <laughs> I'm going to be corny, I guess. Size does matter. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's not easy to say whether or not the size correlates directly with malignancy. Mm -hmm. um, there are some tumors that aren't as uh, actively dividing as, as others. Um, but that's usually not a good predictor of malignant progression. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say that from a, a detection perspective, yeah. just to try and keep that simple for people. Yeah. It was a hard, it's a hard one for me to wrap my head around too. Cause it's kind of like sometimes. Yeah. I, I and there's, there's like, a lot of unknowns there Yeah, too. You go and get a scan. It's like, does it, okay. If, you know, you have a, have a, have a mystery lump and it's, it's, it's you know, you, you feel something in your neck and you're like, yeah. well, it's, you know, I think a lot of people have probably been in that situation where you can find a mysterious lump or something you get it checked out, <laughs> yeah. but you're feeling it beforehand. Um, you know, I've kind of, I had it with a, with a swollen lymph node that was weird before. Yeah. And I was just like, well, is it an infection It's or is it cancer? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, it's probably an infection. It's a, uh, if it is cancer, it's like an inch I'm screwed, you know, so yeah. like, yeah, that's where I come to that question. Yeah. And so, like, I mean, when, when we look at situations like that, I actually had a friend that had uh, a swollen lymph node in his neck, similar situation, actually spread into his jaw. And he's like, do I have cancer? Um, but it's also important to consider the rate of growth there, right? So like if you are if you have a swollen lymph node and it's within days that you have that response, that ain't cancer. That's, yeah. that's some sort of an infection. Your body's responding to some form of damage unless you have late stage chemo that's some, or, or late stage like uh, myeloma or something like that that made it to that that lymph node, but you, I, you would likely know by then. Can a, can a benign lump turn itself cancerous? And I, I, I mean, interesting because people yes. have actually said, yeah, they've actually said, sent, sent me, cause I've got this, you can kind of see it on my earlobe. People have noticed that in close up B roll or yeah. side cam shots. They're like, Hey, you've got a lump on your earlobe. Yeah. And it's like, that thing's been there. I've had it, you know, ultrasound. I didn't notice it. Well, it's yeah. When you, when you have a, a side cam that's hitting you, it, yeah. it is noticeable. Yeah, right. Sure. So people had noticed it before. And, uh, I've had it for years, but I, I, I've had an ultrasound and there's no real blood flow to it. It's just a weird like cyst thing. Yeah. But that's, if there's no blood flow to it, then it's probably, it's probably not going to be, yeah. have the, it's not probably not going to gain the potential to be cancerous. And I'm not necessarily asking this for me right. being concerned about this, but 
it's in general, something yes, that, a benign tissue could become cancerous so under the right circumstances. It could almost develop its own type of cancer. Uh, I mean, cancer is it like um, it's like, hey, this is a random tissue growth. So it depends that- on the the characteristics of that tissue. So you know, like that two hip hypothesis that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. If there's certain characteristics about that tissue that right now are benign, but over time it can cause like a snowball effect. If there's something that's messing with the metabolism of that benign tissue, and let's say, you know, over time it just goes unchecked, that mm-hmm. that one issue can lead to a snowball effect of other things that can lead to other issues arising. And then you have multiple events that may change that benign tissue to a, a malignant cancer. That makes sense. But, you know, it's, it's damn near impossible to say how much time that could be. Yeah, and it's not fair to say it's going to be at any more risk than any other tissue in your body, right? Yeah. So it's like just because it's become it's almost its own entity doesn't mean that it's going to uh, go faster or slower than something else. I yeah. just I hear people talk about it all the time, like oh, yeah. you, know, like a, you know, can that turn cancerous? Yeah. What would be the best place to start for someone that wants to get some cancer detection done that is on a budget or only has a choice to go to maybe HMO or doctor, like what should they like pound their fist and say, I need this test done or I, this, like, what would you say the lowest hanging fruit is? I'm not going to put you on the spot by saying yeah. and hold you to it. But again, I, you know, I, I also full disclosure, I don't have any sort of stock in any of these companies. There's no monetary investment or anything like that. So this is purely from a, a scientific perspective and, and my own probably maybe even limited understanding. Um, if I were to suggest something that people could do, I, I put a lot of trust in the Grail technology, the the blood based biopsies, um, but it's hard to say how helpful that's going to be for everybody, because mm-hmm. you know there, there's also like positives and negatives that come with these tests. They can sometimes give false positives, so that's why like I don't want people relying on one test. But if there is one test they can do, that's a it's a pretty good one to start with. Just try not to be scared if you find something. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I can tell people. Like realistically, yes, cancer is a scary diagnosis. If you find some sort of indication that you could have a cancer from one of these blood biopsy tests, it's just a, a sign that there could be something off that you need to, to further maybe con- consult an oncologist or, you know, someone of whatever nature that cancer might be in um, of expertise to be able to analyze whether or not there's some truth there because of false positive rates. And we're starting to learn more about these tests where those false positive rates come about. There's publications on it. They've published their their data. You know, some cancers are going to be easier to detect based on specific molecular profiles or gene mutations than others, mm-hmm. um, because you know those mutational profiles are, are very different between cancers too. And as a consequence of that, it's also the metabolic considerations are as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you look at just the resources that people have at hand, it's uh, it's it's tough, right? It's yeah. really scary because you're you're almost left with this doom and gloom feeling of, yeah. well, it's almost inevitable that I'm going to get can- You look at cancer statistics and you're, you you start thinking yeah. that, right? And then you're like, well, this is not fair. Like it's, it, it, it looks on paper like I'm almost inevitably going to end up with cancer, yeah. yet I don't have a way to go and just simply test this without almost getting belittled sometimes by what feels like being belittled by the healthcare system, right? Let's yeah. say it's just like you feel broken because they don't allow you to it there's a lot of hurdles to get decent health care and i mean even from my own personal experiences and i know you've had experiences with this as well you know i'm 32 years old and i i just now have decent access to health care and even still having a primary amount of my my insurance covering you know the health care that i need it's still outside of the cost for me it, it would be cheap to get most things done mm-hmm. relatively cheap because my insurance will cover it, but the hurdles just to get the damn thing done mm-hmm. in the clinic are almost worth not going to the doctor. It's scary. It's yeah. it's just so hard to get a, a, an appointment. Mm-hmm. So that's why I think there's a lot of promise to be had in you know these these early cancer detection tests like Grail or, or even companies like Prenuvo yeah. uh, going forward. But you know it is important that you know multiple tests need to be done to be able to to make conclusive. Um, statements about whether or not someone actually has cancer because of, you know, the pros and cons of specific tests. Yeah, I agree, man. But well, yeah. uh, where can everyone find you? Everyone can find me on Instagram, um, mostly. Uh, I have a Patreon. People can support me there if they choose to. Um, but yeah, that's that's mostly it. Right on, man. Yeah. Well, thanks, brother. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks.